Wise men say, never pay full price for late pizza. Hey guys, thanks for coming back for some more popcorn. This episode I'm going to be talking about the 1990 live action movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, this is another one of those ones that really did it for me as a kid and I was waiting like crazy to see it with all my friends. At this point, Batman had already come out and I'd already seen Batman and uh, I'd really developed a huge love for film at this point. I'd seen all the Rocky movies, all the Rambo movies, and I just remember being really into the Ninja Turtles cartoon and hanging out with all my friends after school at this place called Polly's Daycare and watching all those episodes of uh, the cartoon of Ninja Turtles. A real good buddy of mine, Brian, growing up, he was my best friend, one of my best friends growing up. We watched Ninja Turtles together all the time. We were so into it that we were like playing it outside on the playgrounds. We were pretending to be Ninja Turtles. We were pretending to be Ninja Turtles in the backyard. The front yard. Uh, anytime we'd get together in church and play around in the gymnasium, we'd be Ninja Turtles. It was definitely a huge phenomenon for pop culture and for me and my friends and everybody involved. We were so hyped up for it. And when, it, when it's, as soon as the first opening scene starts, it's immediately darker than the cartoon. Significantly darker. Uh, actually, the cartoon made it to be very jokey. Uh, very comical and real lighthearted, kid friendly, family friendly. Whereas, as if some of you know, most of you know, but some of you might not know, is the original comic book actually started with Eastman and Laird. Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird started this comic book back in the day, and originally it was a black and white comic book. They had color covers for the comics for each for I issue but they were black and white on the inside. But on the cover even, originally the Ninja Turtles actually all had red headband masks. They weren't the blue, the purple, the orange, the red. That was actually created to decipher them apart when they had the cartoon and once they gained popularity. As soon as this movie starts out, it was way darker than the cartoon. And I was really excited about that, just like I was the Batman and Masters of the Universe. I liked that it went for a little darker route. It made me like it even more. And they really made the turtles believable. You never saw like a crappy looking turtle in this. I mean, you might have seen occasionally the seam of like where the mask and the costume are meeting each other, but for the most part, it was awesome, man. It looked great and they were really fighting in the costumes. But what was really cool was as it starts off and they did the same thing with Shredder and they did, the, they did this throughout the movie as it started, they didn't show you everything right off. You see April come out of the Channel 3 News, which originally I think it was Channel 6 News. I don't know why they changed it to Channel 3. She's coming out at dark, she's by herself, and she's walking around a corner, and she sees one of the news vans, and there's some guys hijacking it. And what it's showing is, is like kind of the, the downfall of teenage society getting wrapped up in this foot clan or whatever. So these guys are stealing stuff out of this news van, and they see her, and they go and start to mug her. You just see the sigh come up and hit the, one of the lights, and it goes completely black, and then they do this really cool thing where you hear all these sounds and the you just hear them basically beat them up, just whoop their tails. And then it shows the cops showing up real quick and it, it all happens in a you know, matter of a few seconds. The cops show up because then and, and their lights on the cars highlighting everybody. But you see April sitting there and Raphael, the side he had thrown at the light, he, it's still there on the ground. They had to get out of the way before the cops got there, so I guess he didn't have time to grab the sigh. And that moment, when you see April grabbing the sigh and then they show Raphael, not only do you just see this part right here of the mask, and you see the manhole cover, but you also hear him say this. I remember the excitement I was feeling. It's like, not only was there this curse word that was, wait, what? The Ninja Turtles are cursing? It was also exciting that I was seeing the mask and it was actually a turtle and it's like, oh, we're about to watch a Turtles movie. Now the Turtles were dark in the original comic book by Eastman and Laird. They, they actually killed people. It was really, really dark and graphic, but they catered that to a younger audience to sell more toys, sell all kinds of things and turn it into what it is that we know it is today. Ninja Turtles is a massive brand. So for them to have that curse word in there, it was like, whoa, wait a minute. It, you know, I guess it was slightly showing you that this is going to be a little dark like the original source material. But at the same time, they still, once we see the movie, we still see that it is, it caters to both sides. It caters to the people that only knew the cartoon and it caters to the people that loved the comic book. And it kind of did a hybrid of the two things. You start hearing this music that's kind of kicking and the music's been great from the get go. The music really 
sets a good tempo and pace for the film and it really lets you know when things are rising or when things are falling, when things are about to get action, when they're going to get you know a little bit tense, uh, when it's kind of like dreadful when the shredder's around, and we'll get to him in a second. Even when they're being funny, it does some kind of silly music and stuff too, some party music. And the soundtrack is really good too. And all of a sudden you see the Cert Turtles just talking full glamour. They're rehashing the battle they just did. They're just like, oh man, what about when I did this and what about when I did that? And of course, there's the famous Bossa Nova scene. Awesome! <laughs> Righteous! Bossa Nova! What? Yeah. Bossa Nova? Chevy Nova? Excellent! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but right before all that, it does this really cool thing where you see their silhouettes coming around the corner and you just see like it's a shadow of their silhouettes on this wall. And then it's creeping around, creeping around, and all of a sudden, the logo comes up against the screen on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles logo that we're all familiar with. And then the music kicks in. <laughs> So right then and there, we get to see them and they go into their little lair into the sewer and we get to see Splinter and the animatronics are awesome. You know, until this day, this is so much better than any incarnation of the Turtles we've seen since this movie. Every incarnation they've done or adaptation they've done since then has gotten either worse <coughs> or too different to where they were starting from scratch again, but it was never executed as good as this first film if you ask me. There's no CGI involved with the Turtles. It was all 100% practical. It looked great. It was believable. And they were, they were jumping around and fighting and stuff. And it, and it made you really believe that they could do it. I loved it. I thought it was phenomenal. Everybody was freaking out and loving it. But you get to see Splinter in there and you get to like immediately you're, you're in the turtle zone. You're in like exactly what you were wanting to see from like the turtles live action. You get it. They're in their lair. They're talking. They're talking about it shows Michelangelo ordering pizza. I know it is hard for you here. Good. Underground. Yeah, okay. I want a but large thick crust with double cheese, ham, pepperoni. Invisibility. Oh, but no anchovies. And I mean no anchovies. You put anchovies on this thing and you're in big trouble, okay? Look. Echo Legend Low. Uh, uh, that'll do. And the clock's ticking, dude. <laughs> shows them all just having a good time with each other. Basically just showing how they live. And it shows Splinter getting a little serious with him. You know, you guys did good, but you remember to stay humble. Then they have that awesome scene where it's Donnie and Mikey waiting for the pizza that Michelangelo just ordered. Michelangelo does the classic pizza dude's got 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Pizza dude's got 30 seconds. And it shows the guy coming up to deliver the pizza, and I remember, I always remember him looking for 122, 122 and an 8. Uh, 122, 122 and an 8. 122 and an 8. Terrific. Where the heck is 122 and an 8? Because it's, you know, it's not an actual address, it's them in the sewers. And I, and I remember they, they don't pay full price for the pizza, and finally he sticks it down in sideways. And that bugged me as a kid. I remember, like, wouldn't all the pizza just fall off? But then it shows them eating the pizza, and it gets comedic a little bit. They do this little slice and dice thing Leo does, and then all the pizzas get delivered out to all the turtles, and one of them lands upside down on Splinter's head. Ha, ha, ha. Of course, all the kids, including myself at the time, we were all cracking up laughing, loving it, because we just couldn't believe that we were in the middle of what we were in the middle of watching. This live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles extravaganza. Ralph is all still mad about his size, so he goes to the streets, takes to the streets. Yeah, he steps over to the streets, and he goes out there in a, in a trench coat and a top or a little, like, fedora hat, which I'm not sure what kind of disgust that's going to be for a big green mutated turtle. That's where he has a classic scene where these guys are robbing this old lady with Robert Purse. Raphael stops him, and all of a sudden you see Casey Jones in there too because Casey Jones wants to stop him, and that's when we get introduced to him. I love Casey Jones in this movie. A lot of people were mad that he wasn't exactly like he was in the cartoon. In the cartoon, he was a little bit more cynical and sinister acting, and he didn't say much. But this one, they added a little bit more charm to the character. They, he was a little bit more witty. He had more one-liners. Hey, bogey. Now, who died and made you referee? You did your job, now get out of here and let me do mine. These JV lowlifes need to be taught a lesson. He's still, you know, a little a little bit of a wild card and crazy, but I like what they did with the character. I think he made it more, they made it more likable for the film. Finally, some things happen where Raph gets hit and knocked into a trash can. Casey Jones is escaping and Raph is chasing him. Casey's faster, and then Raph yells it again. 
Damn! Now, I have no problem with it. I thought it was great, you know, and I still think it's cool. It's, it's a little more adult, but man, the parents were pissed. And I remember all the kids feeling a little uneasy about it too, because we were like, oh no, I can't believe that this has happened. Kind of like when, I don't know if you guys have seen the Transformers original motion picture, the cartoon from the 80s. But there's a part where Ultra Magnus is trying to pull apart the Matrix, and then he's just like, open, damn it, open. Open. Damn it, open. It made the kids uncomfortable, and the parents were like, I thought this was a kid's movie. Still a great addition to Raphael's character. Raph comes back and talks to Splinter a little bit, and it gets emotional again, it gets kind of serious and everything, and I like that they go back and forth with that, because as a kid, it, it does kind of show you that, yeah, these guys are having fun, but it still is a serious thing that they know. They know Kung Fu, take it seriously, all that stuff. We also get introduced to Danny and his dad, which is April's boss. And, you know, they do the stereotypical classic trope deal in this where she's always in trouble for something she's done or something she didn't do by the boss. The boss is always ragging her about something. And then it shows how Danny and his dad are not in a good relationship with each other. They obviously don't get along. They don't see eye to eye. They have nothing in common. And it starts to allude to show Danny who's actually a part of the little downfall of the teenage society that's joining the Foot Clan. And when they show the Foot Clan, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty cool because you get to see like Sam Rockwell. He's like the leader there asking for cigarettes and he's like doing this little like orientation introduction tour. That's really cool. And also the introduction to the Shredder, the first time you even see him is when he's like, they're showing these TVs and it's just him and he's just like, you just see like a silhouette of his arm and his shoulder and his shadow and everything. And you get to see these TV screens he's looking at. It's just a very, very uh, cool, way that you're looking at Shredder. But then April gets attacked in the subway. She's got Raph's sigh and she had been holding on to it and he's been following April. She gets attacked in the subway by the foot and then Raph is there and then he actually comes out and does a full on fight scene that's awesome and you, there we go. We finally get to see the turtle fighting it. and it's glorious. It's awesome. He's definitely cooler and faster than all the Foot Clan. It works. It's believable. And then he runs and takes her back to the lair. They do this whole thing to where April meets the, the, the turtles and she has this wake-up scene to where it's kind of lame a little bit. I mean, the acting's a little bit bad. It's a little silly. And she says this comment about Harrison Ford. Why don't I ever dream of Harrison Ford? But I guess if you were waking up in front of a bunch of turtles like that and it was for real, you would... I don't know how you would react, to be honest with you. I think that I would be really freaking out and like hiding in a corner like it was in an alien movie or something. But then we get that scene where Splinter explains everything to April and then we also, it allows for them to give an exposition scene to the audience and we get to see the history of the turtles and everything, which is cute, but looked like somebody filmed with a Super 8 camera, like an old video camera or something. Uh, it's weird, it's like, but I, I get it. They're trying to depict like the past with it. And they do this whole thing where they make pizza their first word. Pizza, pizza which is, I don't know, again, all the kids loved it, myself included. But anyways, at this point, he's got the side back. All of a sudden, April just trusts him. So they're going to walk her back to her apartment, stay the night with her, make sure that she's safe. They take her back and everything, and everything's all right. While they're doing that, Splinter gets kidnapped. So at this point now, Shredder has Splinter, and they're pissed off. We get to see a really awesome scene with Raphael just losing it. So they immediately go back to April's and they knock on the door and they're like, oh no, what happened? It's like, it's Splinter. So they have to stay the night there and, and you know, some cool stuff happens. The next day, April has to leave for work and before she has to leave for work, the boss comes in with the son. He's knocking on the, he's like, where you been, April? And then, of course the turtles are having to hide everywhere. But when Danny goes back to the Foot Clan lair, this is when we get to see the official full on awesome entrance of the Shredder. And man, it's epic, it's awesome. It's dark, the music's there, the cinematography's awesome, the shadows are great. Except when we see the costume, it's like, why do you have zebra stripes on your foil cape? And why is your suit made out of sparkly glitter material? Really weird choice that they took. I don't know if it's something that looked good before they put it on camera and after they put it, they saw it on camera, it's like it's too late. But the helmet looked awesome. The helmet was dope. Definitely did a good job with that. And you know, I realized while I was rewatching this that I think Shredder was the first to do the Bane voice. And I know Bane's existed longer than Shredder, but I think that Sh Sh Shredder on screen did the Bane voice before Tom Hardy did. Just check it out. You are here because the outside world rejects you. Raph goes up on top of the rooftop and he really, he's just trying to get some fresh air and it shows Casey 
like just view him with his binoculars over and looking at the other side and he sees Raph doing it and he's like, what the hell? I guess Casey's the kind of guy like Batman or something where he's always listening to the radio scanner for police activity or watching out for crime so he can go fight it. He's watching Raph out there and it's really cool because you see him close up and he gets to witness the whole thing. So what we get is this half and half scene where we see the other three turtles playing around and having a good time inside and April's there showing around looking at some stuff. They're crashing cymbals behind each other. And then while that's going on, Raph is all of a sudden getting attacked by the foot and Casey sees it. So the foot's starting to come up and starting to attack Raph. And at first he's doing a good job. First he's just ripping them. He's tearing them up. But then they, too many of them get there and they take over and all of a sudden they throw Raph inside of the apartment. The fight comes to the turtles inside the apartment and it's awesome. It starts off fun. They're having a good time. It's got some fun scenes. There's the Wheel of Fortune scene. Wheel of Fortune, dude! You have the awesome nunchuck contest scene. Keep practicing. Everybody remembers that. But meanwhile, the whole time, Raphael's passed out because they just beat him up. It's getting worse and worse and worse, and then they fall on another floor, and they go down. All these more Foot Clan soldiers are jumping in. The floor's breaking through. And when they fall through, fire's catching everything. Then Casey Jones shows up, and we have that famous Wayne Gretzky line. Who the heck is that? Wayne Gretzky? On steroids? There's this other scene where Danny's around Splinter because he's starting to get a little curious about what's going on. There's these moments where Splinter actually gets to him and says a few things that gets to his heart a little bit, and he has this real one bygone gym moment that's really good. All fathers care for their sons. So that's when they go to April's old beat up house that she has, and they have some really good scenes there. It shows them, it's kind of like a moment for the, the, the movie to relax right before the third act hits. And I remember loving that scene because Everything is really funny and lighthearted. Casey and April are flirting back and forth, but they're also flirty fighty. You know, they're doing that thing. Uh, there's a scene where Casey's chopping carrots with the katana. I always loved that as a kid. They also do these transitioning scenes where April is drawing a bunch of stuff and she's talking and she's narrating. And I really remember loving that as a kid because I'm all up into art and I really loved watching her draw those as a kid. She's talking about how Donnie and Casey are getting a really cool relationship, then it cuts to them. And it shows them working on the truck together. They do that really funny thing where they're calling each other names, but they're going by the alphabet. No way, Atomic Mouth. Gilgan was her main man. They'd be married and have six kids by now. Uh, Gilgan was a geek! Barferoni? You're the geek, Camel Breath. The dome head. <laughs> Elf lips. That's my word. Funkoid. All right, here it goes. What are we on? Uh, gee. Hmm. Here goes, gack face. But you can tell they're developing a good rapport with each other. And then she does one with Leo and it shows him watching Raph in the tub. <laughs> he's keeping watch over Raph because he's hurt. Jeez, guys. After they had trained a little bit more and having another montage, it shows him meditating. And uh, they have the whole fire scene where Spinner, Splinter appears and they all get like super emotional. I even remember as a kid being like, oh my God, I'm a little emotional as well. Uh, what was really funny is the church I was going to at the time, I won't name any churches, but uh, they had a huge protest against the Ninja Turtles at that point because all my friends at the church, we were into Ninja Turtles, but they had this huge protest against it because there was meditation in the movie and apparently that was like Satan worship. And I was against God. And so like one of my best friends, the guy I was talking about, Brian, I remember coming back from a trip, like a vacation one summer. He was like, hey, I have something to tell you. It's like, I don't like Ninja Turtles anymore. They're from Satan. What? Oh my God. That was a real thing and that was a huge thing. A lot of places in Louisiana, a lot of Baptist type Bible beater areas were just like, oh my God, that's from the devil. I remember Vanilla Ice was from the devil. But because of the meditation deal, they're like, we gotta go back. So they go back to the, the sewer. Danny's hiding there because Danny had gotten a guilty conscience after he'd talking to Splinter. They have this really funny, funny scene where Casey Jones is coming down there with him in the sewer and he's like not talking about how, you know, I don't know if I can sleep down here. And they're like, you're claustrophobic. And it's just funny what he thinks claustrophobic means. Now, what is all this talk about spending the night down here? Mm, you're a claustrophobic. 
Do you want a fist in the mouth? Mm -mm. I've never even looked at another guy before. That's when Casey goes back up and sleeps in his truck. And it's cool they had to set that scene up for him to sleep in his truck because Danny escapes to go back because Danny escapes because he really has a guilty conscience at this point and he wants to go to try to save Splinter. Well, Casey sees that happen. He sees Danny going off and he follows him. And it goes to the foot lair. They're about to take Splinter away and then Tatsu comes in there with the crew and they have that awesome scene where Casey Jones grabs the driver and just does the whole thing and yells for... Then he breaks the curse and the spell that the Foot Clan has on these teenagers and he starts talking about, this ain't no family, and they all like, yeah, you're right, and they follow him, and they go back, and then that's when the awesome fight scene starts out in the city. They have those two classic scenes, one where one of them does like a roundhouse kick and hits two of them in the face. And then the awesome scene where one of them swings something at, I think he swings like a sword or an ax or something at one of the turtle's heads, and then he, he does the classic duck down thing. They're working their way up with beating the Foot Clan and finally they, they get up to the top of this building and they're fighting everybody up there and then Shredder's waiting for them. Oh. And that scene's awesome too. I and mean, even though it's like a uh, painted backdrop that's behind them, it's, you know, they're obviously on a set, it still looks really cool and it looks great. I still loved it as a kid. It's, and as a kid, I didn't know that. But even still watching it today, knowing that it is a backdrop, it still looks good. It still works. The, the lighting and the feel is there. The movie magic's there. Where they really convey like a four-on-one fight scene pretty well. Because it's like, let me see if I can take him. And then he does it. And they're like, no, I got him. And then they realize they can't take him on one-on-one. -on -one, so they got to fight him together. There's this great scene where he's about to kill Leo. And all of a sudden, like, this gust of wind happens. And it catches their attention. And they see that Splinter's over there. Because he's been saved by Casey. That scene's really cool. Because you're thinking, how are they going to have Splinter and Shredder fight? Well, how's that going to work? This big dude with this little tiny rat. He's smarter than Shredder. He's, he's a better ninja because he's just smarter all the way around. Previously, Shredder told all the turtles to throw their weapons over. Well, there was a little set of nunchucks hanging right on one of the ladders. So Shredder's running at Splinter. Splinter grabs the nunchucks, does this little side swipe move. And next thing you know, Shredder's hanging off the side of the building, holding on for dear life. And he ends up, you know, falling off and falling into a trash truck. And then Casey Jones does the whole whoops. which I love. Great. Kill him. Yeah, kill him. Kill him. It turns out to be the perfect happy ending. Splinter makes a little joke at the end. Casey and April start flirting with each other with no fights now, and they finally kiss. She does the whole shut up and kiss me thing. Danny and the dad make up. It obviously shows, you know, there's going to be another movie. The turtles are like, yeah, we're at it now. So they had the song at the beginning that was awesome. At the very end, as the credits are going up, they have that turtle power song. That T-U-R-T-L-E power. Turtle power. by Partners in Crime, crime spelled with a K and a Y. They kind of sound like Digital Underground. In fact, for the longest time as a kid, I thought it was Digital Underground. It wasn't, it was these guys called Partners in Crime. And it, I mean, it was cheesy. And I honestly hate it when they do that with, with movies, when they make songs that are like specifically about the movie and everything in the lyrical content. Like they did that at the end of Friday the 13th part six, Jason Lives. It's an Alice Cooper song. It's terrible, it's laughable. Now, granted, that movie was a parody in its own right. I mean, it, it was the only Friday the 13th movie that was actually kind of making fun of itself. While being still gory in a horror film, it was also kind of a comedy horror film. I still hate it when they do that with those things at the end of the movies. Those, like, again, the T-U-R-T-L-E power. There it is, guys. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990. I think it still holds out. I think it's an awesome flick. Definitely an A plus for me. But tell me what you guys think about it. Tell me if you like that one. Tell me if you like the new Turtles at all. Or if you're excited about the new stuff that they're coming out with. Because it's definitely going to be a reboot. 
completely. They're starting over again. Also, remember to look for us on, on Facebook for Brass Real Brothers. Check me out on Twitter, Brass Real Bobby at Brass Real. Also, remember to hit the like button and share this video if you like what you see and uh, subscribe. Well, thanks again, guys, so much. I appreciate it. And be sure to tune in for my upcoming video, RoboCop. That's right, the original. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. Thanks so much again, guys. Remember, life gives you lemons, make some hot, fresh popcorn. We'll see you.